Good morning, everybody. Oops. I hope everyone's well and safe <clears throat> this morning. Okay. Just give a minute or two for everyone to log in to this morning's session and then we'll get started. All right. All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to our last day of Coach Development Week uh, webinars. We've had a great two weeks. Uh, diving into some great topics with some awesome presenters. So I just want to take some time to thank everyone who has been a part of the success of this week. It's been a lot of fun on my end, being able to uh, facilitate this and even just listen to the presentations. So, uh, and then that brings me to my other part of thanking all of you for being a part of this week as well. And I hope that you've learned something and you're able to take uh, bits and pieces away from each presentation and apply them into your coaching life. So for our last presentation today, we'll be hearing from Matt Ragonia. Matt is the head coach of the men's varsity program at Brock University and is currently the assistant coach for our Boys Canada Summer Games uh, team. So Matt will be presenting on the coach-athlete relationship right now, and then he will be back again tonight at 7 p.m. for the question and answer session. So Matt, at this time, I'll send it over to you. Can you hear me? Yep, I think, uh, I think we're all good here. So just to share... See if I can get this here. Perfect. I am sure. Okay, I got the website here. Perfect. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, as as Lauren said, just to kind of echo the last couple of comments there, but uh, it is the final the final day here. So thanks for sticking with it. As uh, there's been some really good presentations the last couple of weeks. I uh, just wanted to highlight here too. If you haven't, if you've missed a couple of presentations or you want to go view them, they do have them all on the website where you register. Uh, it's on the YouTube page here, so there is a link there. So make sure that uh, if there's some that you missed or you want to get a second look at or, or just to pick up some more information, uh, make sure you tune in there. And uh, they're all they're all listed as they go in so uh awesome i'm uh, really pumped to be here today to talk about uh coach athlete relationships and kind of managing expectations when working with a new team uh just to go through uh, a couple uh overview things that i want to talk about today um in, in terms of what uh, we're going to cover. Uh, a lot of the discussions going to be tailored more towards youth sports, so more towards OVA coaches and, and that 10 to 18 years old uh, youth athletes. Uh, although I am within the OUA, I thought I'd tailor the presentation a little bit more and, and talk about uh, the, the turnover of athletes in the OVA and uh, and dealing with new kids coming in and, and what that looks like. As uh, in the OUA and the OCAA, it's a little bit different. Uh, we do a little more recruiting prior to it, and then we, we know our roster a little bit more as we head into the season and offseason. So so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about youth sport there. Uh, although there's not going to be a specific guideline, I'm not going to tell you how to, there is no the way for a coach-athlete relationship, but there definitely is information here in the presentation you could definitely use to grow. Uh, it's going to be a lot on communication uh, and then adaptation and then self-development uh, to really foster that more positive opportunity to create a better coach-athlete relationship with your athletes. Um, and then same goes with managing expectations and new players on a team. So a lot of the information I'm going to give is kind of a little bit more of my experience is what I've talked about before. Uh, I'm not saying it's the way, but I think uh, later on tonight, if you're if you're able to join and share uh, your own uh, your own feedback, experiences, opportunities, I think that just builds this whole information sharing uh, session as we go along. So uh, kind of to touch on what uh, what I'm going to go through today, uh, I did do my master's here at Brock in 2015. So a lot of it was looking at uh, youth sport coaching and preferred leadership behaviors by coaches. Uh, ages 10 to 16 in that range. Uh, so I am going to talk more on the, the research side about coach-athlete relationship uh, literature and go through a couple different models and uh, some segues into that just to back up a lot of the research and, and stuff that uh, coaches can do with their athletes. Uh, we'll talk about athlete profiling a bit. So again, know your athlete. And uh, again, some of it's uh, a no-brainer. You're going you're gonna to shake your head and say, I knew that already. But just to dive in a little bit more and talk about what that looks like. Uh, we will go through managing expectations. Uh, so managing expectations of parents, athletes, and uh, and your coaches as well, as well as yourself. So uh, we'll talk about a couple of self-development practices that you can look towards. And then, of course, breaking down your communication, which I think is the, the ultimate um, 
indicator when it comes to a coach athlete relationship and building that trust. And we'll talk about buying a little bit later on and what that uh, what that all entails. So let's get started. So uh, just to talk about the coach athlete relationship in terms of the athletic triangle. So you guys see on the right hand side there, the athletic triangle is composed of an athlete, a coach and a parent. Uh, coach holds that responsibility as a parent does at home or a teacher does in a classroom. Uh, they do have the academic triangle as well, which obviously just replaces coach with teacher. Uh, but at the end of the day, these relationships all gear towards building that uh, that positive environment where there's the allowance for self-development and uh, development of athletes. So uh, when we're considering young athletes relationship with their coach, uh, it can obviously aid in the development of life skills. So on and off the court, uh, positive and healthy development, and then of course, retention of youth and sport. So these are only some of the outcomes and benefits from experiences gained uh, through these sport programs. But uh, uh, participation came out with a study in 20, I think it was 2016 that they came out in terms of retention in youth and sport. And it talked about the rate of kids dropping out in sport, especially around 13 to 15 years old. Uh, so when kids start going to high school, they get more integrated with different school sports and jobs and all kinds of different things going on. Uh, but that retention in youth sport, they did a survey with all the kids dropping out and they, they found there was actually a very high percentage. It was actually about 8% of kids drop out of sport because of their coach and and i thought that was a really big uh that was a huge number considering there's about 280,000 kids that drop out of sport uh every year and again a majority might be switching sport or there's other factors let's just cost facility travel there's a lot of other factors but uh eight eight nine percent of uh kids dropping out because of their coach i think is huge and that has to do with the coach athlete relationship and what's what's going on so uh that's kind of where my master's research was built off of i thought it was really important to bring up and as we talk about today but uh, when we're looking at the athletic triangle, so we look at parents, right? So parents are expected to attend as many tournaments as possible, supporting their children, work with coaches to follow guidelines, and then uh, and then also have their parental code of conduct. Um, when you look at coaches, right, coaches are obviously expected to develop practice and competition strategies, um, also look to foster that true motivation of sport. So we'll talk, we'll just harp on a little bit of intrinsic and extrinsic, sorry, motivation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, prom prompting that concept of parents of equal treatment, growth and maturity of children and then uh, notifications to any schedules equipment gyms all, all that extra stuff and then players at the end of the day players want to be appreciated they want to be respected and acknowledged when they do something right by their coach and then in return right can help with solving conflicts between all parties and and that trust between one another so that's kind of just the the background of the athletic triangle as we uh, as we go along so uh you guys are getting more of a lecture today <laughs> on uh, on some of the different models and, and parts of research. And there's a lot of different models that go off of, but I thought this would be a good, uh, just a good one to, to hammer home today. I'm more than happy to share different models of leadership and then coach athlete relationship, coaching effectiveness and coach team building. Uh, we can definitely talk that, about that tonight if, if that's something that wants to uh, be brought up. But uh, the model I chose just to talk about today is the multidimensional model of leadership. So the MDML uh, produced by Chalandari is produced in the 1990s, but the most updated version came in 2007, uh, broken into three different parts. So uh, the antecedents on the left-hand side, leader behavior in the middle, and then it says consequences. I'm not a big fan of that saying consequences, but it just means the outcome. So what, what comes of it? Uh, so we break down the coach athlete relationship. There's a lot more to it than just saying, I want to develop my coach athlete relationship skills. I want to get better at this. Uh, there's a lot of things that play into that coach athlete relationship. So, um, starting off kind of with, uh, situational characteristics. So we're just looking at the antecedents part here. Uh, so situational characteristics refer to kind of the observations that are based on current surroundings. So this could include the type of task, goal orientations, and just the overall environment. Uh, I, I know a couple of coaches over the course of the week have identified what your training looks like. I know Dave Preston talked a lot about when you're building your season plan, what, what access, what availability do you have to different uh, equipment, gyms, and all that. So uh, observing your situational characteristics and what you're given. Um, I know a lot of OVA teams, whether you share gyms, you have single gyms, right? I've, I've coached OVA for a couple of years now, so uh, I've been experienced to both. So understanding what that looks like. Uh, next goes to leader characteristics. So that's really focused on yourself, right, as a coach and, and what that looks like. So what they bring to the team, uh, your strengths, weaknesses, uh, your ability to develop a team based on their age and competition level, right? So for example, like the age and competition level, your athletes would suggest to recommend different levels of coaching actions and behavior. Um, so if you're taking a 13 new team right or an 18 new team right there's a very difference there which uh, which is expected yes but it's good to identify those differences as well and then last is uh member characteristics right so member characteristics focus on athletes themselves right so this includes uh personality need for achievement affiliation that intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and then responding behavior based on situational characteristics 
right? So how, how they're acting, how they respond, how they work together, especially because volleyball is such a, an integrated team sport. Um, just really important stuff to understand about uh, your athletes. Uh, moving over to leader behavior. So this is this is about coaches, right? So this is about us as coaches and, and what we're doing in our in our everyday practices, how we interact with our athletes. Uh, so three different sections there. So just starting with um, number four there. There's no actual order of this is the order. Those numbers are just more there to categorize boxes and they're easier to describe. Uh, so number four, so the required behavior. So behavior from coaches that are influenced by situational member characteristics, right? So uh, coaches are required to behave in a certain way. There are required requirements. There's a coach's code of conduct, right? There's things that we have to follow and adhere to. Um, at the very bottom, so just dropping at the bottom, number six, so preferred behavior, right? So what behavior is preferred from our athletes, right? So there's preferred behavior in situational and member characteristics. So what do athletes want from their coach, right? What are the preferences of leadership styles? Do they want a coach who's fun? Do they want a coach who's engaging, right? And that's stuff that we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper on the next couple of slides. Um, both the required behavior and the preferred behavior filter into actual behavior. So how we actually, we, we do act, right, in real time and, and with our athletes and practices and competitions. So I think there's a difference in understanding the difference between the requirement, the preferred, and then the actual behavior. Uh, where, where the coach-athlete relationship really builds in now is when we look at the consequences or the outcome section with performance and satisfaction. So there are two different sections there, but performance, it's its take what you will out of what you consider performance, right? Performance can be performance on the court, uh, in training, in competition. It could be standings. It could be off the court uh, performance as well. And then athlete satisfaction, right? So the satisfaction and that is where that coach-athlete relationship comes in. So your actual behavior and then the satisfaction of athletes is what's going to build that coach-athlete relationship. So just, just a little summary there, but at the end of the day, when we talk about coach athlete relationship, there's a lot more factors that go into how, how do we as coaches set ourselves up in the best place to have that, uh, that development side or that, that communication side when it comes to coach athlete relationships. Uh, okay. So this is kind of more background literature research that I've uh, I dug out. I used a lot of my research as well. So uh, a lot of it's going to be like, I know, but I think it's good to, to go through and, and talk about here. And I'm more than happy to have a debate about this tonight, uh, just because it's more research based. So I think that's a, it's a fun section to, uh, to talk about. But uh, when we talk about motivational tendencies with athletes, so when we are motivating athletes, when we're communicating with athletes in terms of feedback. So positive feedback, obviously, is one of the more important and uh, preferred traits by athletes. Uh, as age increases, positive feedback decreases right and that's from a perception that's from a perceived view as well uh that's also because as kids get older right there's more expectations from coaches um you might not be clapping around like you do in a 12 or 13 u practice as much as you would in an 18 u practice um so that feedback is going to differ right you're going to have a little bit of uh i wouldn't say negative maybe constructive feedback or no feedback cycles coming through so uh that decreases in terms of negative or no feedback uh no feedback is identified as worse than negative feedback Right. So uh, if an athlete's making a mistake and you're not saying anything, right, then that's going to do more harm than uh, than maybe stepping in and saying a couple uh, a couple notes or things to work on. Or um, even if it is more tailored towards a negative feedback, which we do want to stay away from. Uh, but no feedback is worse. Uh, in terms of team sport athletes, so I looked at both team and individual sport athletes, but obviously team sport athletes feel a little more frustration as coaches have to make time for every athlete, right? So understanding coach to athlete ratios in practice and how you're going to be able to communicate with your group of, you know, nine to nine to 14 kids in the gym, depending on how big your, your team is in club. And uh, if you have any red shirts with you, if you have other kids that are practicing and what that looks like. Uh, in terms of social support, so individual sport athletes prefer less social support, which makes sense because they're interacting with their coach a little bit more because uh, they're usually smaller groups because it's based on an individual uh, accolade that they're working on. Uh, and then as age increases, social support decreases. And that's just based more on factors, right? Factors of growing up and there's a lot of different other influences coming into these uh, these kids' lives. So uh, social support does decrease over time as where uh, it's a little bit higher when you're starting out at the, the younger OVA levels when you're uh, getting going. Uh, the Michael Jordan shots in there because obviously hopefully you've been watching the last dance. Um, the first four episodes have been awesome. I think it's a great, uh, just a great eye opener to, to, I guess for me, how, how long ago it was, but, um, I, I love the quote from Michael Jordan here. Uh, people want to make it happen, wish it could happen and make it happen. So, um, just to move on with the technical instruction. So training instruction, 
right behind positive feedback in terms of one of the more preferred uh, feedback among ages and uh, adult levels. Uh, as age increases, training and instruction decreases. This is just more because we, we move away from the technical aspect at some points and we get more into the tactical, uh, especially when you're getting into that com uh, competitive phase of your OVA plan, right? So you're looking near March and April, right? And May, if you're doing nationals, right? So at that point, I think that um, you're getting more tactical, right? And more system-based and more six-on-six -six wash drills, gameplay, that sort of stuff. So the training might decrease. Uh, in terms of team sport athletes, obviously they prefer a higher rate of instruction than individual sport. And that's just based on the communication. So at the end of this understanding that because we're in a team sport because there's a lot of athletes in our gym that we have to find ways to get feedback and build these relationships with our athletes on the court um, with a lot of them on there right there's one of you and if you have assistant coaches that's great uh, but finding that balance as well uh, i know in the ova uh, sometimes assistant coaches are parents or volunteers that are just helping you out and that's great uh, so understanding that uh, who you're giving feedback to and who you're able to give feedback to consistently and positively is, is important uh, so from there, uh, there's a lot of codes that uh, kind of were put together in terms of uh, different interactions and different behaviors from coaches. So uh, when we talk about reactive behaviors, so reactive behaviors are specific behaviors based off immediate actions or events and responses to others, right? So both in practice and competition. So uh, you win a big point, coaches have their arms up, right? In practice, if someone hits the ball to the net, you're right on them right away most of the time and giving feedback. And those are reactive behaviors. Uh, spontaneous behaviors are general behaviors that aren't influenced by those immediate actions or uh, events. So this is just how you are as a person in general, right? So if they see you uh, on the court, off the court, away from the gym, right? But um, these are behaviors influenced by direct uh, events that happen. And then social support. So themes that would promote the development of life skills, coach athlete relationships, and, and that healthy development side. Uh, I'm not going to talk about every class in here. Um, I'm going to I'm going to skip a couple of them. I'm going to kind of focus on the the three or four that I really wanted to harp on today. Uh, but uh, you can see in terms of the subclass, right? So what came from reactive behavior? So responses to desirable performances, to mistakes, to misbehavior, spontaneous behaviors came to game related and game irrelevant. And then we'll talk a lot more about social support strategies as we get going uh, later on in the in the slides. So in terms of responding to a desirable performance, right? So the type of feedback that we're giving to our athletes, this is all based off research from different studies. So uh, this is kind of the, the coaching implementation that I love to put in with my team and, and my coaching style as well. So uh, just talking about this is what is preferred from athletes and this is not the single athlete every time obviously athletes are, are different across the board but uh for the general population when coaches are responding to a desirable performance uh the type of feedback they want is acknowledgement and then pursuit right so when we talk about that yeah i saw what you did but also what's the next goal on top of it right so kids are not just being satisfied with where they're at but they're also looking for that next challenge ahead of them and building those challenges in their own skill development also helps them down the road when you're asking more of them or you're trying to raise expectations or pressure points in practice. Um, just big, big things to go off of. Uh, in terms of perception and magnitude of reward, so they're just categorized small, medium, large. You can play around with the terms as much as you want, but um, this is kind of athletes preferring their coaching behavior and relationship to differ based on the size of the action or event. So in volleyball, just a way to put it, um, a small reward might be something like winning a point right in uh in a match a medium might be winning a game so i know ova tournaments you're playing five to six games if you're going going to the the medal matches at the end of the day um so maybe winning a game and then at the end of the day a large event might be winning a tournament right it could be winning provincials it could be winning nationals i, I think everyone has a different view on uh their team their age their kind of development uh, i know some age groups for a club might have three or four teams uh so being able to balance that magnitude of reward and athlete's perception to a coach's behavior with it. So uh, as a coach, and this is going to sound really obvious, but as a coach, I'm not going to stand and uh, I'll be standing and clapping after one point, but I won't stand and clap after winning a tournament, right? So those behaviors and reactions, uh, athletes perceive them as needing to be different, right? Because to them, if you're just kind of silent and doing whatever point between point, which is totally fine, and that becomes your end of the day as well, uh, then athletes might not see it as a valuable experience for you as well. Right. So uh, remember, these are just these are just patterns between coach and athlete, right, and their perception and what they see. So, um, again, always, always happy to have a debate on it later, later tonight. Uh, in terms of rewards based on individual athlete, I actually struggle with this one myself a little bit when we when we talk about uh, rewarding based on individual athletes. So it's 
it suggested that coaches will word athletes differently based on their skill level and progress. So obviously in the OU, uh, OBA, right? So coaches, we get a lot of new athletes all the time. Uh, there could be athlete turnover. If you're starting with a brand new team uh, and 13U, there's always a couple of kids that played 13U for maybe one or two years before. So maybe their ball control or skills are a little bit higher. Um, but we might reward a kid who is brand new at volleyball to learn how to underhand serve a ball over the net or overhand serve a ball over the net, where you might have a kid already in that team who's played for a couple of years who can do that already, right? So uh, kids will take that and say, well, I, I can already do that. So why am I not getting praise the same? Because you might have more emotion for a kid that is just learning a brand new skill or just picking something up. Um, it, I always believe myself is that having that conversation with athletes and saying that everyone's at different stages and different levels of development and always challenging them to do something different. Uh, but based on research that's come through, um, their social reasoning actually infers that they still, they still want the acceptance of them being able to get that skill done, even if others are still learning or catching up. So they still want to deserve that certain amount of recognition, even though a coach may believe that they're going to get rewarded for doing something that's challenging for that athlete. Right. So if we're talking about serving and we finally have a kid that can serve a ball over the net. Right. Uh, but we have another kid that can con consistently to a point serve over the net. You might say, OK, his goal might be serve it once over the net. And this guy's goal might be serve it seven out of ten times. Right. That's kind of the baseline that we go off of skill retention. Uh, so and that kid has to serve it seven over ten times over the net. And then you'll be giving the same kind of reward and based on individual athletes. But kids don't see it that way. Right. So keeping that in mind, because I struggle because I'd love to love to chat with athletes about understanding that process. But when you're in practice and competition, right, that stuff is very tough for uh, for a kid to grasp and, and put aside. Uh, and then in terms of report, reward frequency, so too much or too little. So um, a coach who may reward their athletes kind of too much may experience negative outcomes. So such as less appreciation, less appreciation for individual acknowledgement, uh, maybe lack of trust or credibility in the coach's knowledge, and then self-doubt or uncertainty about their own skill set and performance level. Right. So not giving too much feedback. So um, I, I myself started to do this when I was uh, a new coach in the OVA about seven or eight years ago. But every point it was feedback, feedback, clapping around and, and always athletes always looking over after every point and um at some point giving too much feedback right and too much uh too much recognition over and over can can do negative harm uh, and then there can also be times when you're when a coach doesn't reward enough right or fails to respond to a good performance so players could feel disappointed and then self-conscious of their own skill level as well um, i don't have a number for you to say this is the exact amount of performance um, appreciation or too much and too little. Uh, I don't have that exact number. I think it's a, I think it's a play around with your athletes and getting to know your team. And again, the importance of that coach athlete relationship going through. Uh, in terms of responding to mistakes, so this is still a reactive behavior, uh, but when responding to a mistake, whether it's in practice, whether it's in competition, uh, but a couple of different things that come out here. So understanding your athletes' uh, extrinsic and intrinsic motivations, right? So are they motivated to perform an activity to earn a reward or avoid punishment, or are they going to be motivated to perform an activity for its own sake and for personal rewards? So when, when interviewing athletes, when talking with athletes, uh, the type of feedback that kids are looking for after a mistake, right? They want it to be specific, they want it to be honest, and they want it to be goal-oriented, right? So um, I, I see it a lot uh, when coaches will, um, kids will be serving in a game or serving in practice, and they'll say, hey, you can't miss that serve. And unfortunately, like, they, they already know that. Right. Uh, you, you don't have to tell them that that's not the feedback they're looking for when responding to a mistake. Uh, they understand that's part of the game that the ball has to go over the net. Right. And if they don't, then maybe maybe it's a little more rule review and then how the game works. But uh, for the most part, right, they understand how the game's supposed to be played. Uh, so that's not the feedback they're looking for. Right. So the type of feedback is specific, is honest. Right. And then that goal oriented saying, OK, what is next? Right. Uh, we'll talk about asking questions right a little bit later on and building that kind of uh, communication relationship. But um, understanding that kids know what they're doing. Right. It might be really specific techniques that you want to work on or work on change, but they want you to be honest and they want it to be goal oriented and focused. Uh, mistake in practice versus competition. So there's always a technical versus tactical side. Um, so in practice, right, that's your time as a coach to focus on the technical instruction. Uh, while in a game, it might be more attention to current situations or other occurring factors in the game, 
right? So um, telling a kid to, hey, do you know what? I want to reach really high and you're telling them this during the game and they're going back to serve receive, right? If they're focused on the attack still, they're not going to be ready for serve receive. And if they're focused on um, serve receive, they're definitely going to forget with the, the feedback you gave them on attack, right? So there are times to give a little bit of feedback, especially at younger ages, but keep in mind that responding to mistakes is uh, more of a technical tactical comparison. Um, one, one thing that I found that I really love to do, especially when working with younger teams. So um, a lot of my work with uh, here in Niagara with the club teams and, and running clinics, but with the younger age groups, in terms of responding to mistakes, a lot of, a lot of feedback that we give is um, athletes see just outcome oriented uh, results, right? So if you're if we're working on serving over the net, right, there might be some kids that have really good technique, right? And that good first step, that good high contact, but just don't have the power yet to put that ball over the net. Right. So one thing that I love to do in my practices is you can make a rating scale where you can give kids, I usually go about three different cues and then they can rank themselves. And this just helps in that self-evaluation process. But uh, my example would be for a serve, right? So um, when working with a 13 U team, I usually do a scale out of three and say, you know what, if you had a good toss, Right, so what is a good toss? So a toss is <clears throat> high in front of you, about two meters, landing in front of your uh, your dominant foot, right? Um, did you have a high contact on the ball? So uh, high contact means high contact above your uh, your dominant shoulder, right? And then the third one is did the ball go over, right? So at the end of the day, you might have kids that are that lack the power to put the ball over the net for now, but are still consistently scoring two to three and telling you that, saying, do you know what? I reached high, I had a good toss, just didn't put it over the net. Right. And it also holds kids that are at a higher level more accountable. Right. Because I see a lot of kids that can put the ball over the net easy based on power alone. Right. But they just might be chomping the ball over from a sidearm. And at the end of the day, that's one out of three. Right. So when they're running around the court to go to the other side and they pass you as a coach and you say, what do you score yourself? And they say, you know what? It was a really bad toss. I kind of had to save it and swing sideways. Like it went over. So like one out of three. Right. So building that, that technique and that self-evaluation process, I think, is really important. It's a good way to respond to mistakes as well, where you give kids that opportunity to build their own uh, their own skill set there. Uh, just moving ahead. So this is this is quick, but game related behaviors. Right. So uh, these are more spontaneous behaviors. So what what kids are preferring from their coach, which is easier for them to work with. Uh, but obviously the technical instruction. So coaches that understand the game. I think the OVA has done a great job in terms of providing resources for coaches. Um, again, over the last two weeks, just alone, the webinars have been great uh, stuff that we can definitely imp implement in our own season plan. So um, understanding the game uh, and then organization, which I thought was a really interesting piece. But a coach who can show knowledge of the sport, technical cues and communicate properly like earn it, it will earn the trust and respect but also develop that stronger connection between a coach and an athlete um athletes want to see their coaches organized right so if you're showing up right on time to practice or five minutes late for practice if you don't have a practice plan with you um depending on what you're going to use for your uh, communication right so we'll talk about it later in terms of a hard practice plan a whiteboard it's on your phone whatever it's going to be but kids want to see that you are organized right they don't want you to be stuttering in between drills when kids get water um for their water break, right? That's your time to set up the next drill or have a quick meeting with your assistant coaches and then move on. Uh, in terms of game irrelevant behaviors, right? So what do kids want from their coach? They want you to be authentic, right? So be true to yourself and to your athletes, right? It's okay for you to tell your athletes, right? That, you know what, if you had a long day, I know a lot of our coaches in the OVA uh, have job, like you have full-time jobs during the day, right? You may be tired, right? And that's okay to tell them, right? Because at the end of the day, you expect that same communication coming back to you. Right. So um, the one thing that kills me the most is when kids um, have a really tough practice and I'm on them all practice and they come up after and say, you know what, I had a really bad day today. I didn't sleep last night and it's just been really tough. And at that point, you want that to be communicated a little bit earlier. Right. And uh, it, it's not a, it's not a cop out for athletes, because obviously if this starts showing up three times every two weeks or three times or once a week now. Right. Then it's something to bring to attention with uh, with parents and saying this is what's been coming up. Why are they so tired? What's happening here? Are they eating properly or what's that next step? And then humorous. Right. I think this is a no brainer, but kids want to have fun. Right. They want their coach to be funny at times. Right. Um, but also balance that organization concept uh when you need to be serious you need to be focused and then be humorous as well so i i love getting there early 15 minutes for a practice uh, as long as the net's set up right i'm i'm playing short court with my athletes i'm after i've talked to my coaches on what the practice plan is going to look like uh, and then having conversations with athletes right even while just volleying a ball back and forth or volleying to a basketball net but there's ton, tons of opportunities there um okay so to talk about social sports strategies so 
uh, I call it the three C's. This is kind of based right where I, uh, this is kind of the hit home part for me. Um, there's a picture with all my 13 new athletes. We had two teams training together two years ago. Uh, so 24 athletes in the gym, which was crazy uh, with two courts, but uh, I loved every minute of it. But uh, these social support strategies, I think, are, I think are huge, right? So um, communication, compassion, and community. So communication. So when we talk to our athletes, right, go to your way to talk with your athletes. Right. Um, I, I always try and rotate in practice, even at even at the level down in the OUA. But uh, when my athletes are warming up and just warming up shoulders, right, it's a chance for me to have a quick chat with them and then get them focused for practice. Um, I, I love the idea. I got this from uh, the past Canada Games team. Right. They were training at Brock uh, probably three, maybe four years ago. And um, and they would always give handshakes when they come into practice. Right. Uh, after they get water, they come back in. It's high fives, handshakes, whatever it is. Um, I, I really that really stuck with me. And I think that's a big part to a lot of the coaching that I do now where anytime I get the chance. Uh, so when my athletes come to practice, I, I get a handshake from each of them. And when we're done practice, I get a handshake. Uh, I've seen coaches in our club, our local club, develop uh, a handshake, high five or fist bump. That's kind of up to them on what what they want to do in terms of that. Um, that connection, right? Obviously now with, with the stuff going on, it might be a wave from a distance, but um, the principle's there, right? So um, it, it's really good for athletes to lock in. So when they give you a handshake to start practice, it's saying, I'm here, I'm volleyball focused, I'm leaving everything outside, outside, let's let's have a good time. And then at the end of practice, right? Whether they had a really good practice, then you get that three seconds to acknowledge that. Um, if they had a really tough practice, you get time to acknowledge that. If they're mad at themselves, if they're mad at a teammate, if they're mad at you, you get to control that right away before they leave the gym. Right. Um, I, I think it's a huge motivator for me, too, because especially with a lot of teams coming in and out when clinics, when I do, uh, when I've had multiple teams in the past, when, yeah, it's definitely a respect thing. It teaches life skills off the court, but it's also a chance for me to see 36 athletes move in between a quick shift between courts and raising the net. And I get to see all 36 athletes, even if it's for a second or two, um, it's better than nothing. Right. Because I, I would hate to leave a kid out where they just walk out of the gym and they might not have talked to me in the last half an hour, depending on where I've been working or who I've been working with. Uh, compassion <clears throat> so compassion that we care right so um the first thing i do right take it take it as you want but the first thing i do is i write down every birthday in my calendar right and uh when it's an athlete's birthday if it's on a practice night that works perfectly if it's uh me shooting an email to the parents uh depending on whichever team that you're coaching uh just to say a happy birthday it goes a long way uh follow up on activities right so i've had kids in the past tell me that um maybe on a thursday practice that weekend they're going to see a leafs game which is unfortunate for them i'm not not a big leafs fan but uh but follow up with them the next week right so write it down on your practice plan for the next we can just say hey quick follow-up before practice right so that next week i'd go up to whoever and say hey like i saw the leafs lost i'm just assuming that they lost but go see and say how was the game right and those little things add up right so now when i want to communicate with them that practice on working on something right there's already a connection built and developed and maintained uh of course you're gonna have to find what's inclusive to your age group right but uh, i can say coaching 13 new boys a couple years ago when fortnite hit hit the hit the scene, right? I think that was a huge thing. So working on uh, having about five to six kids every practice doing Fortnite dances during drills to getting it down to like one or zero was pretty good. But understanding understanding these different, uh, different trends that are going on with your athletes is great. Um, and then last is community, right? So how we integrate. So um, team events, putting in planning work, uh, and then integrating your parent groups early. I, I heavily suggest if you're coaching club, right, to integrate your parents early into your uh, season, especially if you're a new coach or you're working with a new team or you have new athletes, which is uh, which is easy to get lost in uh, with everything going on. But um, I think it's a great idea. I think we had uh, we've had team events before where uh, <clears throat> all the athletes and coaches have gone to Sky Zone, right? We'd go back to a parent's house after uh, for a big team party, and all the kids have name tags, all the parents have name tags. I think it's a great way just to get everybody integrated, um, especially because when we're looking at that athletic triangle, we want everyone to be on board as much as we can, and it just all helps, right? Um, this is kind of the end of like the, not the presentation, but the literature review itself. So looking at the anti sentence and leader behavior, right? Um, taking control of those different factors or working on those factors can lead to higher performance and satisfaction, which at the end of the day is trust, which at the end of the day is that coach athlete relationship. Okay, awesome. So uh, as we talk about um, coach athlete relationship building and training, right? So a couple different things that, uh, I'm going to go through. So customizing an athlete profile, a discussion on buy-in, managing expectations, and then individual player meetings and what that looks like. So as we customize our uh, athlete profile, so learning about your athletes, 
right? Uh, what kind of learner are they? Number one, right? So uh, I did a quick test with a 15 new team that I took. Uh, this is probably four or five years ago, but uh, they were a new team for me and I was a new coach. Uh, so I, I gave them some resources, do a couple of tests. There's a lot of resources online, but to learn what kind of uh, learner they are, right? So are they an auditory, right? Do they, do they learn from just hearing people speak and give cues, right? Are they a visual learner? Do they like to see it on the whiteboard? Right. I started transferring a lot of my practice plans at Brock specifically to a whiteboard. I know OVA coaches, you might not have that luxury all the time. Uh, some gyms do have it, but um, to see a visual setup, right? If you don't have a whiteboard, then make sure you're setting the drill up on the court, right? So then you can talk and show, right? Or kinesthetic, right? Do kids learn from, from touching something, right? Is it throwing a ball, right? Is it you just raising their shoulder or raising their elbow and saying, this is where your elbow needs to be? Right. So learning this about your athletes, um, it also it also plays a big role when you're when you're talking about drills. Right. So if I have a drill set up and I'm speaking, right, uh, there's some athletes that are looking at the court and looking at the drill. Right. So instead of saying, hey, pay attention. Right. Their visual learning might be I want to focus on the drill. Right now, if they're like doing something behind or like jumping into the wall mats or something, that's a different story. But in terms of their learning style, make sure make sure you can customize and, and be flexible with kids learning styles um, about your athletes. What happens when they struggle with the skill? Right. Do they shut down right away or do they get very frustrated and angry? Right. Do they blame other people? Do they blame themselves a lot? Do they shrug it off and move on or do they challenge themselves? Do they come to a coach for feedback? Right. So all this information builds up to learning about what they do when they struggle and how you can better communicate something to them. Right. Um, every athlete is definitely different with this because they range in their skills. Right. As they get older and they start breaking into more positions, right, position specific, right, then these skills become a little more refined and, and finite in terms of what they need to work on. But still, overall, everyone needs to have good ball control. Everyone needs to serve a ball over the net. Right. So a lot of it's definitely uh, through and through making sure they're getting fully developed. Uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses? So pretty simple. Right. You can give an easy rating scale. I think it's something that you should do right away, especially when working with a new team. Um, their interests, hobbies and successes. Right. It's OK to spend the first practice of your season going through this stuff right? Take the time, right? It's just as important, right? If you lose one practice, these kids are playing a lot of volleyball in their high school seasons as well. Uh, obviously the boys go early in that uh, September, November, and then girls start, some start in December, but January, January, February is major for them too, right? So they're getting a lot of touches. Um, and then what are their goals for the season? So this is kind of the life coach side of me. I, I do own a business on the side of life coaching, working with kids ages 10 to 18. So I think it's really important when you identify their goals for the season. So what are athletic goals? What are academic goals? What are personal goals? Uh, when you get a little bit older in that 17, 18, you bracket, right? What are, what are their career goals? Right. And I think it's really important because um, it's something I use in OUA as well, right, with Brock and with the guys and um, identifying these different goals for them, for them to set these goals. Right. And then you can hold them accountable. They hold themselves accountable. Again, just building that interaction with them and having conversations, I think, is really important. Uh, so keywords. Right. So this is based on customizing your athlete profile, but keywords like the reason athletes use keywords right during competition training, it's very easy to get caught up in the emotions of the game. And that often takes away the focus needed to be successful. So keywords can be words, phrases, acronyms that, that really help with that focus, motivation, and even instruction at some point, right? They can help you bounce back from frustration, um, whether it's from some choking points or failure, right? Uh, they're very unique to every athlete. Right. Uh, keyword. So keywords lose your value. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. So when, when we're going through keywords, right. Um, I think it's really important to find keywords that work for different athletes. Right. So what I do is I have usually my, my red book sitting around in practice. Uh, but anytime I find a keyword that works with an athlete, whether it's based on serving, attacking, bouncing back after shanking a pass, bouncing back after um, missing a swing, right? I'm not saying I have 500 words, right, for every athlete, but each athlete usually has two to three different keywords on skills that they're really trying to work and develop on. Uh, and you're helping them get to a point where they can consistently do it themselves. Right. So a couple examples, an easy one I always use for serving is chase. Right. So chasing the ball into the court. Right. So if an athlete has a good toss uh, or sorry, maybe they're tossing the ball straight up or maybe they're jumping straight up on their serve. And you're trying to get that jump float for them to chase into the court a little bit more just to minimize that time between contact point and then reception contact point. Um, but giving that keyword of chase, right? So when they go back and serve, they're going to start telling themselves, okay, I'm going to chase the ball into the court. I'm going to go get it, right? And that's what kind of um, gets them going, right? And, and gets them set for their, their serve. Um, we use the radar gun a lot at Brock. Um, and I'm sure every OUA team does as well. But uh, with the radar gun, right? I, I know Nate uh, talked about it yesterday, but kind of looking at a speed of, of serve and 65, 67 uh, kilometers an hour for a float serve. And um, we have someone that serves at about 64 consistently and the ball moves a lot. 
right? And sometimes they'll try and do a little bit too much and put some more power on it, but their contact point's not high enough, right? So for me, their, their keyword is, hey, 64, right? When they go back, it's, hey, 64 into this seam, right? So for them, they're resetting, they're refocusing, saying, I know what 64 feels like. I know what it looks like. I know how it feels. I know where I land in the court, right? And all that stuff just helps them with their process when they're going in. Right. And that's just serving. You can use a lot of different keywords uh, when you're blocking. Um, I know Nate talked about uh, palms, the baseline yesterday. Right. So uh, I think that's a really big piece um, in terms of retention. Right. And then focusing on one specific acronym or, or word. Uh, but write these down. Right. Write these keywords down and make sure that you have them in practice because keywords will lose their value when they're not used in competitive situations. Right. And again, hence the importance of them being readily available by being written down in, in, in places that you can find them. Right. So whether it's in your practice plan, whether it's on the whiteboard, whether it's something the athletes written out or they have, you see a lot of uh, NBA players writing stuff on their shoes. Um, but, but these keywords are just as important. So keeping that in mind um, and then buying in. Right. So this is this is always a term for me that I, I I always have a laugh at because I think I think people always go a couple different ways when they say buy in. And one of the things I get from coaches is saying, oh, you know what, my team is just not buying in. Right. And my, my response to that is what what is your idea of buy in as a coach? And I think I'd love to talk about this a little bit more tonight from from coaches who can jump on the webinar. And I'd love to have a discussion on your thoughts, because um, the examples below are just examples I came up with quickly just to show a point. Um, they might not be as accurate as I want them to be. But uh, what's your idea of buy in as a coach? Right. And then what's what's the definition for an athlete? Like, What do they see as buy in? Right. So coaches and athletes, right, our expectations and perceptions of, of abilities, decision making or general inclusion, it, it's going to vary from all different levels. Right. So my easy example is a 12 to 14 U. Right. Um, for me, when I coach 13 U boys. Right. For me, if they showed up and they're ready to have fun, that to me is already buying it. Right. If they're open to trying something new, even if it means failing at times and they're just open to it. Right. Then they're buying in for me. Right. And if they can attempt, if they can even attempt to self-evaluate right? Then that for me is a win, right? And that obviously changes, right? When you change and I'll go to maybe 15 or 16 you, right? So um, as a coach, if you're using uh, a lot more video, right? And uh, I think a big discussion is that a lot of OBE teams, I, I know um, I keep bringing it back to Nate, but Nate and I talked on the phone the other day and said, we, we really think that all, every team in the OVA should have video, right? And that could be part of your parent expectations to have someone in charge of that, but um, give teams the opportunity to watch video on themselves. Right, and not just highlights of that one hit ten times over for ten seconds, but um, but a fifteen sixteen you start to watch video and attempt their own notes. Now you might have a really advanced fourteen U team that you've had for three years or two years, and that might be a little bit earlier for them, and that's up to you. But um, but attempting their own notes in video, right? Even if it's way all over the place, right? Um, it's something to start, right? If they have a growth mindset, so you see a lot of fifteen U and sixteen U athletes when they start going to high performance programs and. Um, if they're a one or two dimensional player, right? Some kids can really attack the ball, right? That might be their go-to in 15, 16, but learning that there's, there's more to it, right? There's different shots. People are growing and jumping higher. There's a bigger block, right? Um, there's different approaches that are needed. So, and different shot selections uh, and then developing that self-assessment of their own abilities, right? So again, continuously learning how to self-assess themselves. And then the OCAA and OUA, like you can pick and choose, but like just to, just to go through, but athletic performance and taking care of body, right? Your self-care, uh, academic standards and maintaining. Uh, coaches have a little more um, viewing in that academic side. As an OVA coach, you probably don't have that. And then uh, discipline and seeking out personal career goals, right? So a lot of our conversations with our upper year athletes are what's next, right? Are you looking at a master's degree? Are you looking to go play pro? Like what, what's it going to be? And helping as a coach as much as I can to, to help them achieve that. Okay, just taking a look at the time here. We're doing we're doing all right here. So uh, managing expectations. So this is again another fun topic to go through as I as I uh, as I was picking and choosing what I wanted to talk about a couple of weeks ago. But uh, when you're managing expectations from a, from an OVA standpoint, right? There's a lot of times where you do have to manage expectations, right? Uh, the beginning of the season. Right. So when you have your parent meeting, which we'll talk about uh, during the season, obviously, there's a lot of expectations of practices um, post tournament. I feel I think most coaches can agree with me on this, uh, but a lot of emails or phone calls that you receive might be after post tournament um, end of the season. What does that look like? And then off season, right? So off season might not be as heavy for OVA athletes, but if they're playing beach, right, if you're part of their beach program, um, 
I know there's a re-signing period too pretty early, right? So if that's taken care of early and you're you're doing work, if they're going into camps, anything like that, uh, but managing those expectations. Uh, so we're going to talk about preseason meetings. We're going to talk about working with athletes on the team, uh, individual player meetings, and coach uh, initiatives. Perfect. So um, when we talk about uh, preseason meetings, so this is a slide uh, on the right-hand side. I, I, I just have it. I took it from one of the teams that I was coaching with Niagara Rapids in terms of team values and expectations. Uh, but when you get a chance to work on your preseason team meetings, so uh, preseason is obviously right after tryouts. You've done all your, you've got all your forms in, you've got your official team and you're ready to roll. And having that athlete and parent meeting together is, is really important because you get to set the tone and set the rules, expectations, guidelines for the, for the whole season. I think that's really important because uh, when you're trying to manage expectations during the season it's something you can easily refer back to right so uh, in terms of athletes right so you can see the athletic triangles back on that sheet of paper um, I printed out these sheets of paper and had them had them done by uh, by athletes and coaches uh, I had a pre-coaches meeting already uh, at the time so we filled this out as coaches so expectations of our athletes expectations of each other as coaches and then expectations of parents um, so what I did in the group it was with the 13 U teams there's 24 of them so I think we split into groups of four or five um, I would actually recommend probably next time if I do it, I would go down to maybe three uh, just to keep the groups a little bit smaller. Uh, but in those team activities, right, they're writing down their goals, right? So it could be individual goals, their team values, so things that stand out to them. Um, but then also expectations of each other, expectations of coaches, expectations of parents. Um, the one thing I did not do, which I would totally do next time, is have parents fill this out as well. Right, they can work together. They can do it on the stage. You can do it as a whole group. But uh, the answers that you get in terms of expectations of each other are awesome. Um, I, I do have a 13U kid or a group that wrote down expectations of parents, and they literally said, "Feed me at tournaments," which I thought was, which was just awesome. So, uh, but that's their expectation of their parent, right? It might not be to be louder on the sideline or trying to give feedback during practice, but it's to feed them at tournaments because that's very important to them. It seems so. Um, Having them fill that out, I think is huge. You can tailor it however you want. Uh, the template's not hard. If you, if you want it, I can easily send it, but this is something you can come up with pretty quickly. Uh, in terms of role of parents, right? So um, the roles of parents, I call it the trickle down effect. Um, and, and I tell parents this every year when I coach a club team, because I think it's really important to understand this trickle down effect where if parents are not happy or they're not satisfied um, and them communicating that to each other with a kid in the car on the way home or just in general, uh, it's, it's a lose-lose situation where you have parents that uh, will say some stuff, right? It will come down to the athlete, trickle down to them. It'll trickle down to them coming to practice like that or their behavior. And then that's where they're going to perform at a lower level or not be open with a growth mindset. They'll have a pretty fixed mindset on where they sit, right? Which means in the end run, you're probably not going to have them developing a lot, which might hurt their, maybe their playing time or something that's going to come later on, right? Depending on your level. But that trickle down effect, I explain every single year. Right? Um, does it work? Uh, probably, probably here and there. But I think the point is to announce it and talk about it, so you've got it there. Um, with parents as well, right? So additional management positions, right? You usually have a team manager, but if you have parents that want to be involved, let let them be involved. There's tons of stuff for you to give to parents. Uh, like I said, the match recording. Right, so having a parent in charge of videoing matches, they could be doing a game each, a tournament each, but having a massive file to post that stuff after. Um, food stations, right? Obviously, at tournaments we see the big, um, the big food stations from all the clubs. Uh, maybe a fundraising or sponsorship coordinator, uh, and then if you have some parents who want to do stats, right? You you might have to check those stats once in a while just to make sure they're they're right. But setting an expectation out and uh, having that feedback, parents want to be involved and, and give them that opportunity to be involved. Um, if you're a coach on your own or you're missing an assistant coach for the night and you need some parents to step in and toss balls and then it, it's totally there for you to use right so keep keep it in mind especially at the younger ages i think that's a i think that's a big part and then coaches right so coaches this is important too because as coaches we want to be on the same page technically right even if it's in smaller roles your assistant coaches might be parents they might be um young students at university or college helping out they might be a bigger brother or sister right so um even in small roles there's definitely things that you can provide uh understanding roles and drills and always being active right and then delegate Right. Even if it's incrementally. Right. So delegating small things. Right. Even if they're running a warm up at some point. Right. But um, one thing I always found working with coaches in, uh, in club season is giving giving them two things in a drill and say, you know what? All you're looking for is this. Right. If you see this not happening, just remind the athlete. Right. And having athletes bought into that process and that feedback structure, I think, is really important. OK. Um, so common indicators uh, with new teammates. So 
when when you are a new coach, if you have new teammates, uh, if you sorry, if you have new athletes that are joining your team, uh, I know depending on location, so um, some clubs don't have a really high turnover of athletes, some really do. Um, so just depending where you're coming from as a coach, but um, for for new teammates, right? This is obvious, but it's it's out there to put, so you see it. But if a new kid is joining a team. Right. They might know maybe a couple, depending if they've played before, they play in high school or something like that, but they might not know anyone. Right. If they're traveling from a little bit farther, right, they, they might not know anyone. I know social media at the the, the older ages um, does they obviously have a good job with um, connecting with each other and, and talking to each other over the course of the summer and through high performance programs. But um, just to be with them, right, could be a new experience for them. Uh, new athletes may be behind or ahead in uh, skill development right? Which might frustrate others, right? In both a positive and negative way. So like you might have athletes that come in and maybe they're dropping down from a higher level team than they were last year. Uh, they might be ahead of the pack. And what does that mean for them? What does that mean for other athletes, right? They could be coming up from a lower team or just being brand new to volleyball, right? And again, what does that mean, right? For athletes um, that are already there trying to wait, right? Or the new athlete who is obviously seeing that they might be behind the specific skill. And of course, leadership positions, right? So it might be confusing with new additions and maybe not knowing who is who and, and who is uh, not who's in charge, but I think who's a big piece of the puzzle in terms of being a leader on the team and where those roles, where those roles come down. And that's why the magic expectations is really important. Um, as a coach, Right. So as a coach, you can do a lot of different things. Here's just a couple suggestions, right? Especially, especially when starting out with a new team or with a new one or two athletes joining your team, uh, but rotating players and drills, especially in warm-up. Um, <clears throat> as a coach, you have a power to do that, right? So if you're going to rotate every two minutes in warm-up, if you're going to say grab a new warm-up partner, I, I feel it's always tough because when you say, I want you to go with a different warm-up partner by practice number three, they might forget who they've been with and they might just go with their friend again. Um, so you can set those pairings up as a coach, right? It takes a little bit of extra time, but you can set those pairings up so people are rotating or people are at least seeing different people that they, they haven't interacted with as much, right? Um, obviously in warm up, I like people to rotate and, and practice with each other. A lot of them go over the net, right? When they're warming up before practice, uh, but in game, they're gonna have their own warm up partner and I'm totally fine with that, right? That's obviously something that it's part of their routine, that, that's their prep, uh, but rotating in practice, I think is really big for integration. Uh, setting team and individual performance objectives that aren't win-loss oriented, Right, so you might be setting some goals during your drills, especially at the beginning to integrate new teammates that aren't based on single failure um, or success ratios, right? Um, it might be a team goal, right, where everyone's part of it and everyone's um, adding to that value. Uh, establish group pregame routines and warmups. Again, something that's great with all new athletes together. Um, praising efforts and not just results. And then when errors are addressed, making it about the team and not the individual. Right. You have time for athlete feedback, uh, but especially with new athletes on your team or the new team. Right. Um, not not targeting specific individuals when we uh, when you go through. OK, um, in terms of individual player meetings, um, when you get the opportunity to do so, I always say to, to have these player meetings when you're uh, post tournament. Right. They can be five minutes long. You can come up. 10, 15 minutes earlier, 10, 15 minutes later, there's another practice going on after, ask if you can use the stage or anything like that. Um, obviously there's a rule of two, right? So uh, the rule of two just states that you have to have someone with you or you have to be within visual eyesight or, um, or within listening range, right? So the easiest way is to uh, have them on the stage, right? You can be on the stage with the um, cover open, right? So people can still see you and you can have your player meeting. Uh, if there's parents on the stage, right? You can easily send an email to parents before and say, hey, do you know what the stage is used for player meetings tonight? Um, they're either in the hall or if you have closed practices already, then you're good. Um, one thing I always do in player meetings, right? So document everything and then confirm with them, right? So taking notes during, right? And then having them sign off after. Say like, you know what? We talked about this and this. You agreed with this. What do you think of this? Does this sound like what we just talked about? Right. Um, and then when they're good, they, they can sign off on it. Right. It's really quick, really easy. But I think you just it holds them accountable as well. Uh, in terms of your conversation, right, that you have in your player meeting. So the effort versus performance discussion with athletes. This one always I, I caution coaches when they talk to when they when they give feedback about effort with players in their meetings. Right. So uh, obviously the common question might be, how can I get on the court more? Why am I not playing or why am I getting subbed out early or anything like that? But um, if I would caution you saying, you know what, I just keep putting in maximum effort and you're going to find time on the court. Right. And I think that's a big no, no, because you can have a lot of that backfire on you when kids come to you and say, you know what, like I'm putting in maximum effort. Right. I'm still not playing. Right. And for you, it might not be perceived max effort, but for them, they can say what they want and say that they've been working their hardest and it's very tough to, to justify against that. Right. So um, 
And at the end of the day, we're talking about coach athlete relationships. It probably doesn't help, right? When you're telling them put max effort in and you're going to see the court and then they do to their ability or to their uh, assumption and then they don't play, right? So that hurts that coach athlete relationship. Um, so now telling them, you know what, put the maximum effort in, but there has to be a performance indicator on there too, right? So I'm looking for max effort, but you have to get better at performing this skill, right? Or this execution or this criteria or whatever it's going to be. Right. So at least now it's saying, I just can't put full effort in. I, I need to learn to get better so I can perform at that level. Uh, training indicators and performance indicators. So meeting standards and making the most of your opportunities, I think is always a good, um, a good setback for them um, just to, to mull over and go through on their own. Uh, the power of asking questions and meeting and training, right? So I, I always let athletes talk first and you can see the next point below about letting them speak, but um, let them talk, right? They want to have a voice and they want to feel inclusive in this, in this communication. So um, when you're having that meeting, right, they're, ask them questions, right? They're going to have answers. And if they don't, right? It's an opportunity for you to step in and give some, right? But you've given them that opportunity. In training, right? I love the training saying, um, what happened, right? If they serve a ball in the net, you say, hey, what happened? And the answer you might get is, you know what? I tossed the ball way too low. It was in front of me and I had to chop at it quickly. Awesome. What do you have to do? Well, I have to toss a little bit higher. I have to contact high. Cool. You might get an answer a lot of the time that says, hey, what happened? They're going to say, I have no idea. And that's totally fine because now, now that gives you that opening to step in and say, well, maybe you should take a look at this or consider this or think about this when you're serving. Uh, just to keep moving along here, uh, to let them speak, I just I mentioned, but uh, that understanding team roles. So, so speak those team roles, right? Don't assume they're presented as clear as you think. Uh, as a coach, we, we might know them, but um, I think a big part is taking stats, right? Uh, and letting those stats uh, – show right because you can give a lot of information stats whether it's in practices competition um if you want to know what kind of stats you can take at the youth level uh from the first chair podcast with frank and terry uh had nathan jansen on and uh did a really good job of talking with stats to use in youth sports so the links there definitely suggest you taking a look at that if you're interested about stats in youth sport and uh and to look ahead um that quote do your end goals align with your process uh, I will be clear. I took that right from uh, from Ian Ebbett with uh, the McMaster men's team. Uh, he was doing a presentation with um, the Timo Elite Group in Niagara on uh, in December, and and that that quote came out: "Do your end goals align with your process?" And I thought that was a big standout. Where a lot of athletes, right, have an end goal, but are they putting in the work in their process to get there? Right. If the answer is no, right, then then you have that conversation. What needs to be done? Right. Uh, in terms of expectations and limitations, so um, your drill purpose and communicating, right? So make sure your drill has a purpose and make sure you don't bounce around, right? You're going to lose attention to detail, especially in club volleyball, where if you're working on serve, receive to attack, but your main focus is that serve, receive, right? Giving feedback on the attack, right, is going to confuse your athlete back and forth, right? Um, if you're focused on just the transition, right, or sorry, just the pass and transition, then don't worry about the attack at that point right? Focus on, did I take care of the ball in a positive reception? And did I transition out wherever, whatever position you're working on, right? Um, if you're working on the attack, right, specifically the attack, then don't worry about the pass as much, right? If you're putting it all together, then you can communicate that. But understand that, know what you want to get out of your drills and, and communicate that with your athletes. Um, when we say, how can you expect my athlete to, right? So as a coach, right, from a tactical perspective, spot right how can i expect my athletes to serve specific targets in a game with the same location velocity of movement when you serve whatever in practice right how can you change a defensive scheme mid-game or execute a game plan if you don't practice that right so in a drill on defensive drill you might say you know what we're going to work on this right and after 10 points or, or so you said you know what let's change defense right away right and let them learn right because in a game if you have to change based on your opponent i know you guys there's five six games a day right you might have to change your defensive scheme if you're at the older level and can they do that have you worked on it? tactically right or sorry technically right blocking line versus cross right so maybe you block cross and serve receive and then line in transition right depending on the athlete depending on your game plan right but have you practiced that right and then uh psychologically right so can how can you expect your athlete to deal with performing under pressure if you don't create pressure situations in practice and then how can you expect your athletes to understand their role in the team if you're not talking about that right how can you expect your athlete to right uh how can you expect to develop a good coach athlete relationship if you don't put work into it Okay. Sorry, I feel like I'm rushing a little bit here, but I've got like three more slides here and I'll keep an eye on the time. I don't want to keep you guys super long here. Um, so just to go uh, 
to look ahead to build communication skills, right? So this goes to our coach athlete relationship in terms of communication. This is a really cool project assignment, whatever study you want to call it. I, I have some stats for you on the next slide, but my challenge to you guys is as a coach to to really dial down and give this a shot when you get a chance when we get back into the the normal regulation life of uh, having practices and seeing our athletes. But uh, let your team know in advance, let your parents know and your coaches, right? Just that uh, maybe one practice you're going to be recording, right? So whether you have your phone on you, you have a recording device, uh, but keep it by your side of practice, right? Don't put it in your pocket. It might get a little bit muffled, uh, but it's a chance for you to review your communication skills as a coach. Right. So after the practice, again, it takes time. Right. But it will pay off for you. And I've done this myself before. And I, I thought it just it spoke words to me. It was awesome uh, to see how much I was uh, speaking different things and talking about some stuff. So uh, what feedback do you give? Right. Is it meaningful? When I started out in warm up, I could hear myself in warm up saying, hey, good job. Good job. Yeah, good, good. Right. And like, is that the feedback you want to give? Right. Is it meaningful? Right? Uh, how long does it take you to explain drills? Right, so I'll credit Keith Wozlik, who who talked it, uh, who spoke last week. Uh, Keith did my level one, um, my in class, and then he was my evaluator for my performance level uh, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, but uh, he always asked me, he's like, "How long does it take you to explain drills?" And they say, "Can you explain a drill in 30 seconds?" And it is a lot tougher than you think. Right, so how well do you have to be set up before you lose kids' attention in the drill? Right, so uh, you can time yourself, or you keep that that tracked when you're going through your uh, your recording. And then important, are you using your keywords, right? Or are you just being general, right? You create these keywords. If you're not using them, then we talked about it. We said it, it's going to depreciate the value of those keywords or putting the time into that, right? So um, I thought it was really interesting, right, to give it a shot. And you can actually break them down in percentages. Right. So this is a study done in 2017. Uh, I was with soccer coaches. Right. But I see no difference in terms of the sport and where that uh, turnover is going to be here uh, on the left hand sides, all the different coding systems that it went through. You do not have to do this much. This is a lot. Right. If you're looking at uh, the total instruction, right, total questioning, total feedback, total modeling, total silence. Um, those are kind of the main categories, and I, I put them on the the main uh, the main chart here. Uh, but these were really broken down into specific uh, specific communication patterns, right? So the study itself looked at communication to athlete percentages and training, right? So uh, as a coach, how much are we communicating to our athletes, and what are we communicating, right? So total instruction, total questioning, total feedback, total silence. So silence might be something that is um, you're just not saying anything, but there's no drill, there's drill going on, but you're just not paying attention or you're not doing anything, uh, or silence on task, right? So if there is like six on six going on, or you're watching someone perform a couple reps before you give feedback, that's the silence on task. So the study was done over three years. I chopped it just to make it over uh, the course of a season, uh, just to get some just data. Cause I know OVA coaches, a lot of you are just within your one season, but, uh, what came out of it was total instruction, right. Is obviously very high. These numbers might be higher when you are working with different levels, right? So obviously a 12 U team, you're probably a bulk of your communication is going to be a lot of instruction, right. And less questioning, which is what we see here. I think this was with 11, 11 to 14 year olds, I believe. So I, I can look back at the study for you guys if interested, but um, from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, right? Uh, total instruction dropped, right? Because now you're kind of focused more on that tactical side. Uh, total questioning increased, right? So now at the beginning, you're kind of setting your defensive system, you're giving some techniques. Um, and then at the end, you're asking more questions to your athletes and saying, what if, right? Or what happened? Uh, total feedback, right? So a lot of feedback from the beginning of the season, right? Positive feedback um, and giving that goal-oriented feedback going through, uh, posting that season where maybe not as much feedback. It might be more considerations. It might be more, um, you can look on the left-hand side. There's a lot of different feedback and, and uh, sections that could fall under. Uh, and then the total silence and silence on task increased by the end of the season because you want you want them to start making decisions on their own, right? You're not, you're not holding their hand when they're on the court. So I think it's important as a coach to... Um, to give those opportunities for them to learn from their mistakes and have conversations with each other on the court. Uh, really cool study. I am more than happy to share that study. It's not mine. Um, it was done in the UK, I believe, but uh, there's definitely studies like it that are close to home too. So uh, just to kind of wrap up the last couple slides, um, but uh, at the end of the day, right, your coach athlete relationship is gonna be built off of staying the course and staying consistent, right? So as a coach, right, so don't forget your values and practices that you implemented at the beginning of the season. If you do that athletic triangle, right, and you don't bring it back, right, and you don't talk about the values your team came up with, uh, what I did, I guess I didn't mention it, but what I did with that sheet is I summarized all the themes, and then I sent them out to all the parents. I said, print one out for yourself, print one out for your kid to put in their room, 
right? Um, so they're not forgetting their values, right? Something you can bring up in practice. I think the OVA has done an awesome job, right? Staying the course with their uh, with their values, right? So honesty, integrity, and excellence, right? So staying consistent with those values and pushing and, and pushing those values, right? So um, we may say a lot as coaches, but we have to stay consistent. So the handshakes and practice, right? Don't, if you see a couple of kids walking away, right? And you're just like, ah, not a big deal, right? You, you can't do that, right? Because then kids say, well, he forgot or he didn't do it or whatever. It's not a big deal, right? And that's where you start to lose that, that relationship, uh, that coach athlete relationship. Um, video review after tournaments, right? So if you had a bad tournament, you say, no, nah, we're not watching any video, right? Like that's not, that's not productive. It's not consistent, right? So um, building a season plan. And being confident with it. Um, if any of you get the chance, or you did, to watch uh, Dave Preston's presentation on uh, season planning, I thought that was an awesome presentation with a lot of really good value in it. So uh, again, the links are all online, but uh, take a look. But stay stay with your season plan and be confident with it. Right? If you're bouncing around or you're not as organized, right? Um, I know there's a lot of technical directors out in the area that can help with the, that season planning, but um, build a plan and be confident with it. Right. So then you can plan accordingly. Right. And have your team progressing and, and peaking at the top time. Uh, challenge yourself and your coaches to accountability, especially in the delivery of feedback. Right. Um, I love the idea for myself is always challenging myself. Right. To to stay accountable. So whether it's whether it's birthdays, whether it's handshakes, whether it's high fives, whether it's that communication piece to uh, rotate around to a different player at the beginning of warm up just to have a chat with them. Um, sometimes I have to write it down. Right. But it holds myself accountable that I want to make sure I'm doing the little things right. Because at the end of the day, right, if I'm asking my athletes to change a system or, or do something under pressure, or we get to a big match, right, or a big point of a match, right, and there's a timeout and I can speak to them with all eyes on me, right, and get and get the execution or the hope of the execution that I want, right. And then keywords, right? Don't use them once, right? Be proactive, right? Write them in your practice plan, right? Give them to your assistant coaches to note as well, right? You can put it on a Google Doc if you want and have it printed for practices, uh, but make sure that you're on the same page, right? So when you give those keywords, they're not fluttering between people and you can stay consistent with your message. Um, my my takeaways, I really hope oh, this, this presentation itself that uh, you're getting, that some of the points that you're gonna pick up are just dedicating the time to get to know your athletes, right? Um, Coaches can strongly influence the quality of an athlete's overall sport experience, right? What, by setting goals, by conveying personal attitudes and values, and, and making the most of your interactions with your athletes. Uh, we have such a such a cool job to interact with these athletes every day. And um, you look at 10, 15 years down the road and, and what these athletes, what these what these kids are going to be doing when they're adults and families and jobs. And um, I think it's really really important to to have a good relationship with your athletes. So down the road, right, whether they give back to coaching, high performance programs, wh whatever it's going to be right but keeping that retention in sport and those um and athletes in that high performance uh loop i think is really crucial uh the overall connection experience between coach and athletes can have that positive effect like i said on levels of participation and then the larger context just sport and life right so the three the three big ones right be knowledgeable and keeping your feedback simple right creating a culture and falling in love with the process if you love it your athletes will love it right and then using sport as a tool for developing life skills really really important i think um all, all the major points going through uh, this presentation when we talk about managing expectations, right? Uh, doing the small things, right? Take the time, right? Identify, make sure you communicate it, right? And you're setting yourself up for a better conversation with your athletes and better communication and, and at the end of the day, better develop as you go through. So um, the game plan kind of for tonight, um, I, I kind of want to take it a different way too, where it's not just a question period, but I actually, this is a cool topic because there's no the way I'm building a coach athlete relationship. I think there's a lot of indicators and a lot of positive opportunities, but I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of learning to go through as well. Right. So, um, what I would like to do tonight, hopefully if, if a lot of you guys can join in and, and chime in, but uh, questions on any of the research or information provided, more than happy. My email's down at the bottom. Um, if there's any coach that presented the last two weeks, I'm more than certain that they're more than happy to, to help you out with uh, any questions you might have. But uh, if you actually do want the thesis manuscript that uh, came out of this uh, Athletes Preferred Coaching Behaviors, I'm more than happy to send you to read. I think it's a good read, um, especially for those that are finding some extra time nowadays to, to dig into some new uh, information. Uh, I, I want to have a discussion on self practices, right? And as a coach, what, what you do, right, to build that coach athlete relationship and what you found has been successful or not successful over your time coaching, uh, whether it's been uh, one year or maybe nine months, because this year didn't really go all the way through. Um, 
maybe it's coaching for 30 years, right? I think, I think there's always, um, I think there's always a good discussion that can build around it and then team building, right? So that community aspect, I, I think it's one of the most important parts of uh, retention, right? Uh, especially in, in volleyball and the volleyball context. But um, I'd love to hear from you guys when it comes to that team building and, and community aspect. So uh, that's what I'd love to get out tonight. I, I don't need it to be a question and answer as we go along. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure you just type them in the chat and I know Lauren's going to get to me uh, with those and I can answer them right away. Uh, but I'd love to just have a full discussion tonight with coaches who are who are open to having them and uh, from any level, gender, age, competition level and uh, and we'll get at it. So thanks for having me and uh, thanks for taking part in these these coaching webinars and hopefully you picked a couple things out of today and then across the week uh, weeks. And uh, yeah, Lauren, I, I don't know if you're taking over or what's going to happen here, but <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks so much, Matt. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. So just to recap the recording of this presentation and all the other ones, Matt mentioned it earlier, but they will be on our YouTube channel, which is OVA HP videos. You can find all of the Coach Development Week webinars there. And it's also available on the website, our teamontariovolleyball.org. You can find all of the um, recordings there as well. So we are out of time right now to do some questions. Uh, so why don't we save all of the questions and then the discussion points for tonight at seven o'clock. Hopefully everyone can tune in. And yeah, so we'll see you then. Thanks again, Matt. We really appreciate it. Robert, thanks for having me. Have a good day, everybody. We'll see you tonight.